So remember a couple of weeks ago when I told y'all about Purpose at Steppenwolf? Yeah, that's the play everybody's been talking about, not just me. The one showcasing the drama of a fictional black Chicago family full of esteemed civil rights leaders, pastors, and Congress people. Yeah, now we're on the same page. Well, people have been raving about it so much that the run has been extended again through mid-May. The Sun Times, the Daily Herald, and the Trib have all given purpose four stars, with the Trib calling it the birth of a truly great new Chicago play. So, don't wait to go see it. The show must close May 12th, and tickets start at $20 at Steppenwolf.org. That's Steppenwolf.org. Today on City Cash Chicago, Illinois lawmakers are considering a bill to create a statewide guarantee income program. It will provide payments of $1,000 a month to qualify residents. Now, if it passes, it means Illinois will follow in the footsteps of Chicago, Evanston, and Cook County, which have all already run guarantee income pilots. That makes it a good time to revisit our conversation from earlier this year about how these programs work and who they help. It's Monday, April 15th. I'm Jacoby Cochran, and this is what Chicago's talking about. Dr. Eve Ewing is the host of Guaranteed, a podcast that explored these programs and the people who participated in them. Eve, welcome back to CityCast Chicago. How are you doing? Good to see you. I'm so excited uh, to have you here. So excited to talk about this podcast. But let's start uh, it, where you start in the podcast. What is Guaranteed Income? And also important, what is it not? So guaranteed income um, is a little different than a term that really popped up and bubbled up a lot around the last presidential election that some people might be more familiar with, which is universal basic income. And universal basic income is what it says. It's universal. So it's a payment that goes out to everybody regardless of of their wealth status, whereas guaranteed income is a direct cash payment with no strings attached, that in these cases goes to um, particular people. And so different communities, different cities and counties can make a decision and say, we want to provide direct cash payments to, for example, um, single parents under a certain age or elders who are over a certain age or um, immigrants or recent arrivals or folks who make beneath a certain income threshold. So basically, it's a program that gives a direct cash payment every month or some regular period of time um, for a set length of time um, so that folks know that that income is guaranteed. And the no strings attached part is really important. So guaranteed income is different from other kinds of assistance programs that we have in our society. Um, This money is not saying, okay, you have to spend this on school supplies. You have to spend this on healthcare. You have to spend this on housing. It is just money that just comes to you and you as the recipient decide what you want to do with it. We've had economic collapse decades before now. We've, <laughs> right. we've had hardship, right? We People have needed money forever. Right. Um, why right now does it seem to be popping up and piloted in, in so many places, particularly in Chicago? Uh, you know, we're always on the forefront of big things, Jacoby. <laughs> you know, that's how we do it, you know. Um, so it's, it's kind of wild. So um, across the United States, there are about 40,000 guaranteed income participants, and 9,000 of them are in the Chicagoland area. And so we are, you know, almost almost one in four of guaranteed income pilot program participants are, are right here in Chicagoland. You know, one of the things um, some of our experts talk about in the first episode that I think is really true is that I think COVID changed some people's thinking around the idea of receiving direct cash assistance, right? Because during COVID, lots and lots of people just straight up got checks from the government, Mm -hmm. right? Um, You know, when lots of people found themselves out of work, uh, out of the blue, and um, the entire, you know, infrastructure of society as they knew it was no longer functioning on a day-to-day basis, I think all those things really made some people realize like, wow, anybody... (laughs) Um, in this country um, can really be on the precipice of disaster at any time. And and for a lot of people, those payments really made a huge difference. So I think I would like to think that that changed some of our, our sense of political will for this type of work, as well as, again, I can't emphasize enough, you know, organizers and folks that have been pushing this for many years and pushing us to be creative. I mean, whew, can we talk about how our society, how folks frame this conversation before COVID, because you talk about, you know, this pandemic in some ways 
had more people thinking like, oh, shit, I didn't realize half of Americans can't afford a five hundred dollar emergency. Right. And now so many more of us are in a, an emergency before this. You know, how, how do we typically talk about people who are receiving social service programs, you know, guarantee income pilots? And, you know, how, how did like those sort of misnomers or um, like like judgments go into the work that you were doing as well? I mean, you know this because I've heard you talk about it in the show, and I know a lot of your listeners know it. There is a narrative in our country that is, you know, centuries old that, you know, if we want to get, you know, professorial about it, we could take it back to the Protestant work ethic and the origins of capitalism in the United States and all this other type of stuff that assigns moral failure to the idea of being poor. Like you're poor because you did something wrong. You deserve it. You didn't hustle hard enough. You didn't grind hard enough. You didn't pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Folks who are themselves struggling economically also internalize these ideas, right? Mm -hmm. Folks internalize these ideas about themselves. They internalize them about others in our community, right? And there's always that hierarchy of like, well, I might be poor, but at least I don't live in public housing or at least I'm not, you know, dependent on these type of programs. Um, even some of the folks we, we spoke to who'd received guaranteed income, you know, one of the things we would ask them about is like, you know, what what they would say about these stereotypes and, you know, um, you know, just to throw one out there, there's this idea that, okay, if people get this money, they're going to spend it on drugs. People when you get this money, they're going to spend it on shoes, right? They're going to spend it on kind of... I get a paycheck every two weeks and I spend it on drugs and on shoes. And you spend it on whatever <laughs> and you want. Me. And nobody comes, it, nobody checks you. Nobody checks you. And, you know, one of our guests, um, economist Damon Jones says this in the first episode. He's like, okay, you think rich people don't spend money on alcohol and drugs? Like, have you met, have you met the rich, <laughs> right? You know, and nobody, nobody is coming for them to talk about how they spent their money. And so, yeah, this idea of people are going to spend it on drugs, you know, people, they're going to spend it on shoes and things like that. That is something that some guaranteed income participants Think about themselves and they'll be like, well, you know, this should be expanded, but we have to figure out how to get it to the good people and not the bad people. And that's something that I just really want to push against um, and help us understand that, you know, if we live in an affluent society that so many people, especially low income people, especially people of color historically have built often on the blood, sweat and tears of their unpaid, you know, unappreciated sacrifice, um, then perhaps everybody should be able to reap those benefits to just have the basics, right? To just have a, a warm and safe place to live live in the winter, um, clothes on their back, you know, food in their belly and like some sort of joy in life, whatever brings them that. This episode is brought to you by ShipStation. If you run an e-commerce business, you know how much work it takes to produce something great while dealing with complicated shipping issues. That's why over 130,000 companies have turned to ShipStation, an innovative tool that allows you to focus less on shipping and more on building your brand. With ShipStation, you can manage orders, label printing, reporting, and customer service on one easy-to-use dashboard. You'll reduce warehouse costs with reliable enterprise solutions and save thousands on shipping costs with discounts up to 89% off. Plus, you can effortlessly import orders from everywhere you sell online. So, turn your shipping challenges into opportunities for growth. Go to ShipStation.com and use code POD to sign up for your free 60-day trial. That's ShipStation.com, code POD. It seems like a year ago, everyone was talking about this. Lots of programs were starting up, but now I'm seeing, you know, not as many headlines about it. Why is that? Yeah, you know, I mean, we're in this like ongoing onslaught of crises. And I think that it's really important when we every crisis that we can see that's facing our city, that's facing our country right now. Something they all have in common is a long, deep history. Right. Um, when you look at the migrant crisis that's happening, when we look at what's happening in, in Palestine and Gaza. And I think that a lesson we should take from that is like, how do we think proactively about the type of world that we want to build. And unfortunately, when those types of uh, major crises hit us, it takes our attention away from being able to think, okay, how do we not only address where we are right now, but how do we build proactively to the world we want to see in the future? And so everybody is very strained. You know, everybody's attention is very strained and our budgets are very strained. But I do think that part of what's exciting to me about this, this type of intervention is it can really address so many of the intractable problems. It's not a magic bullet, you know, it's not a it's not a, a miracle drug, but it can really 
make a dent in some of the really intractable problems that otherwise we have been thinking about and will be continuing to think about for years. And that includes things like mental health. That includes things like the types of lives people are able to live after they return from having been incarcerated, right? That includes the way that young people do or don't have access to the job market um, and do or don't engage in acts of violence or become victimized by acts of violence. I by no means mean to suggest that guaranteed income is going to solve all these social problems. I mean, but time and time again, when you ask people what they need, Money, Money is the first thing <laughs> right. that's coming Money. out of people's mouths. Money. Yeah. And well, the, sometimes people won't even say it because it doesn't occur to them that that's an option. Right. So people will be like, well, I really need a car. You know, like I really need to I, 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 I got a car, but I can't put gas in my car every month. For example, I can't pay the insurance on my car every month. I, I can't pay my car note. You know, um, I really need health care access. I have a chronic illness and I can't return, you know. Um, and then also these type of emergencies. One of the there there are many stories on this podcast that that move me to tears. Um, but one of them was one of our guests, um, Topaz, um, who's just an amazing person and so fun to talk to. Topaz talks about um, their sister passing away. And, um, losing their sister very suddenly. Um, but her, their sister had, had, um, had dealt with a chronic illness for a long time and then, and then finally passed and at a young age. And Topaz was like, I was able to provide services, cremation services for my sister. And I was able to buy food for my family to come over and like share memories of my sister and like talk about her and laugh and clown and joke and eat some food and have some fellowship. And when I asked Topaz, you know, your sister passed away, what would you have done um, had you not had this income coming in? And just that question made their breath kind of like, you know, like just having to think about it was so anxiety inducing. And those types of stories are familiar to many of us. And it literally is heavy on your chest, right? Like your heart is beating fast. You don't feel good. The phone rings. You don't know who it's going to be. It's going to be the bill collector. You know, like those things affect us physically, mentally. They affect how we interact with each other. They affect the economic and interpersonal choices we make every day. And so what would it look like to make those kinds of basic investments in people and just to see like what, what we get back? What kind of dividends are we going to see from that? Topaz was a part of the Cook County pilot is and is in episode five of the podcast, right? The bulk of the show actually follows individual stories. Episodes are named after people. What was the most surprising thing you heard when doing these interviews? I would say one of the most surprising things. Well, actually, I'm going to speak for my production team. So um, the way one of our producers put it was they had thought they went into it thinking that this money would be a cushion for people in case of an emergency. And what they came away realizing was how many people are in a constant nonstop state of emergency Mm -hmm. in, in our communities. And like, you wouldn't know it from interacting with people, right? That they are, they are living life. They are doing their best. They are raising their kids. They are going to work. They are doing all the things that they can do to have the life that they want to have. And in the back of their head, what is gnawing at them is the fact that things are not okay. Can you recount talking to someone and maybe not them having that realization in the moment, but watching them sort of move through that of, you know, I was getting by and this money, you know, either helped me to address something that I was already going through or it sort of revealed that I was ignoring something. Um, One of the participants we spoke to, Raul, um, is a parent of two kids who both have disabilities and who have really specific needs and they have really different needs. The money changed his relationship to money. Um, and it also, I think in our conversation became clear, and this, this was true with, um, we had three of our participants that were parents, um, Stephanie, uh, Raul and Sharif for all parents. And I think for all of them, um, changing their relationship to their kids, you know, um, is, is something that, Um, in all these ways. No, it's true. Money doesn't buy happiness. It doesn't make you a good parent, but it does allow you to provide sometimes some of the basic things that they knew. And it's like, again, we're talking about $500 a month. So in the city of Chicago, Chicagoland area, this is not going to tip you from, you know, this is not going to bring you to, to millionaire status. But the thing about the direct cash payment aspect of it is each of these folks got to choose how they want to spend that money. And as parents, they had an understanding of, These are the high impact things that I can do. So for Stephanie, it was, 
I really want to provide some mental health care in my family because I've inherited some some things that I don't feel great about from the way that, you know, I experienced my parents and abuse in my home and I don't want that happening in my home. So I'm going to I'm going to spend some money on my mental health and my child's mental health, right? That is a targeted thing. It's not everything, but it's one thing that makes a difference. For Sharif, it was, you know, just providing some basic income, putting foods on food on the table as somebody who was formerly incarcerated and who had, you know, that setting limitations on the type of employment he could pursue as well as the money hit right before the holidays. And he was like, yo, to be able to just go get gifts for my kids and get fly outfits for my kids made me feel good as a dad. It made them feel good, right? And for Raul, um, you know, his kids have a lot of needs and some of the money he used to be able to stay home, to have the flexibility of schedule. So, um, you know, one of the stereotypes of guaranteed income is, okay, people are not gonna work. Well, sometimes, guess what? When people are not working, they're at home caring for their children. They're at home caring for elderly family it's not members. The worst thing in it's the not world. the worst thing in the world to not work, folks. You know, mm-hmm. I, I hate to tell you. So for each of these folks, the five hundred dollars is not like it's lifting them into another economic stratum, but they were able to make these targeted choices that really transform the way they relate to their kids. And we can think about how that pays off for genera we we can't even we will never know the intangible difference that that makes in that child's life, that their parent was home or that they provided this thing or that they had this therapy session, right? It gives you, it gives you chills because it's just the kind of thing that, you know, pays intergenerational dividends and we will never be able to quantify that. Yeah. I was honestly in the middle of your answer, I was getting a little emotional because it was making me think of a conversation I had with my mom a couple of weeks ago. I I went over her house. She was like laying in the bed and she was in a very like a reflective place, like thinking about her childhood. Mm, You know, you're in trouble when you walk in, your mom's and thinking about things. (laughs) Yeah. Her early adult years. And we started having this conversation and I was just like, man, when I I'm when you were at the age I'm at now, you had three kids. You were raising your your little sister and two of your little brothers practically. And at the time, I didn't realize just how much financial stress you were over every day, getting up to go get on the Metro to go downtown and then back on the Metro late, you know, back. And I was telling her essentially just how good of a job she did shielding us. And she she really got choked up and started crying because I don't have children, right? But as a child whose mother did everything she could to not make us feel that we were struggling as much as I now know we were. Right. And just seeing that, you know, all these years later, she still questions how well she did it that and just hearing Nah, you 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 did good. You did good. good. You, 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 did, you good. did good. Yeah. You did what the best you could. What you had to hear these parents, you know, you know, get a little bit of relief in those moments um, was so cool throughout the podcast. And I appreciate you sharing those stories in this conversation. Um, Thank you, you know, for sharing that story. One of the things that, as we were looking through this topic, and you know, helped us to realize that how many different programs they were from city ran to nonprofit. And I wanted to know, was there any significant difference amongst those who are participating in nonprofit run programs versus pilots from municipal governments, a la Cook County, Evanston, Chicago? Yeah, that's one of the things. So um, each episode not only features a different um, person, but each of those people is a different a participant in a different program. And we say up front, OK, this person is participating in a program with, um, you know, with Equity and Transformation in Chicago that is focused specifically on formerly incarcerated folks. This person is participating in Evanston and Evanston is targeting, you know, immigrant folks, um, uh, older folks, right, young folks. It's important that we have these different types of pilots because in some cases, participants are receiving additional supports outside of just the income. So for example, you know, there's a pilot that focuses specifically on parents. And in addition to the income, they're also getting coaching. They're also in like a support group. Um, In other cases, I think it's important to focus on specific populations because they might have hurdles to getting the income um, that other groups might not have. So for example, you know, if you are undocumented and we're doing a program that's targeted at folks that are undocumented, they might not have a bank account, right? Or they might not have access to, they, they, They might need a different type of payment, right? Um, And so uh, for folks that are elderly that might be receiving other social service benefits, for example, we want to make sure that the income that they receive doesn't price them out of eligibility so that, you know, now they're not getting their their SNAP or now they're not eligible for their housing um, because they receive this income. That's backwards. We don't want that to happen. So I think that, um, you know, I don't have a good answer for you in terms of kind of like drawing broad comparisons. And so what people should do is look at their own community and think, who are are the folks? 
that could really benefit from this assistance? And what would it look like to provide them, you know, to embrace them with with financial support and other supports here in this local context, which might look different than it does in Cook County? And that's okay. These are all pilots. That means a lot of them have wrapped up or will wrap up this year. A lot of these municipal programs are using COVID funds, which we obviously won't have in the future. Do you think this is realistically something that will take hold in Chicago? You know, um, so in Cook County, um, President Preckwinkle has said that she she said this all along, that she intends to make this a permanent part of the budget and that this is going to be a permanent fixture of our county. I think that was a bold thing to say. I appreciate that. And, um, you know, uh, Cook County is a lot of people. And there were hundreds of thousands of people that applied for these pilots for very limited spots. And so it's clear that there is a need. What is the current status of these pilots? How long will it take for us to get some of this data after they wrap up? So for the city of Chicago program, um, most of the the payments have been disbursed already. And then for the Cook County Promise um, pilot, um, the final payments are going to happen December 2024. And so, um, so, you know, data is rolling in, but those two will will continue to be wrapping up. And um, yeah, it should really be, it should be interesting. But again, I personally believe, and I'm not in charge of nobody's city budget, which is probably for the best, um, but I personally believe that the evidentiary basis is there um, for us to think about making making big moves on this and making a, a permanent part of the budget. What do you think would have to happen for not only guaranteed income to become policy, but as we learned early in the podcast, maybe be expanded to to bring in more folks who maybe make more money to, you know, offer a little bit more money and, and you know, and the like? Absolutely. You know, I think that um, I think one of the reasons that these programs can thrive where we live is that I do think that there's broad support for them. So part of what we wanted to do when telling these stories is to take something that for a lot of folks is not a household conversation. You know, this is like a a very um, specific economic policy thing and to make it something that feels familiar for everyday people to say, I know what this is. I know how it works and I want more of it. Right. And to demand that of their city council people, um, you know, uh, and to demand that of, of the mayor, to demand that of the governor, to demand that of, of, you know, the county and to demand the expansion of these programs. So one thing that I hope will happen is for regular folks to just feel like they have a handle on this policy. It's not that complicated. It's, it's a policy of giving people money. That's the policy. That's it. And we all just watched it happen. We all just watched it a, happen. It happened. I would say relatively efficient way. Right. I, yeah, don't, absolutely. I don't know what no. it looks like to try to give hundreds of millions of dollars uh, direct payments to people. And, you know, people have come out and said, well, what about fraud? What about the way people spend money? But people needed money. And, and we gave a it lot them. of people got money. A lot of people got money. And, again, and we're still here. And we're still here. Still the moving. world world did not implode. And so I think that's one of the things that has to happen is that we have to have the the ability to have those everyday conversations. That's policymakers' job and researchers' jobs as well to to make things accessible and understandable to regular people so that folks can turn around and say, I want more of this. You know, I want to see this happen. And I, I want people to understand that your mythical idea of what type of person, you know, what quote unquote type of person is participating in this. It's just regular people that live around you, G. It's just normal people going through normal things who are cool and funny and interesting and silly and like make mistakes. And um, and I, I think that that the more that that is the face of what this policy looks like, the more I want regular people to start asking like, oh, OK, maybe this is something that I could benefit from or maybe this is something that my family could benefit from. We appreciate you for being here. Dr. Eve Ewing is a professor, sociologist, author, Southside G, (laughs) (laughs) 10 other things I hope you're getting paid for, and the host of Guarantee. You can listen now wherever you get your podcasts and check the show notes for links and more information. Eve, as always, thank you for making time. I appreciate you, Jacoby. You have a great one. To be clear, the guaranteed income bill being considered by the Illinois Senate is targeting people who recently gave birth or adopted a child, people enrolled in educational or vocational programs, people who have been formally incarcerated and are now in reentry programs, and people who care for children, older adults, or people with disabilities. But details, including the final payment amounts and how long the payments would be for, are ultimately going to be decided by a task force. The bill is still in the Senate Appropriations Committee, and even if it passes, the earliest the program would start would be after 2027.
Before we let you go, stay tapped into all CityCast Chicago has to offer by heading over to our website, chicago.citycast.fm. And while you're there, to get the latest news and events in your inbox every morning, Monday through Friday, subscribe to our daily newsletter, Hey Chicago. Of course, we can't rap without some good news. Tonight is the WNBA draft and coming off one of the most exciting seasons in college basketball history, all eyes turn to what the Sky plan to do with their two first round picks. Now, after an offseason that included hiring a new coach and trading your former WNBA Finals MVP, I'm personally sitting with a whole lot of anticipation. As always, we appreciate you for listening. We're going to be back bright and early tomorrow. We'll talk to you then. Peace.